Hello and welcome to International House of Japan, IHJ's webinar series, Leaders Shaping the Future of the Indo-Pacific. I'm Yoshi Sagara, Senior Research Fellow, Asia Pacific Initiative, API. API is a Tokyo-based independent think tank and the hub of IHJ's research on international relations and the geoeconomics. The COVID-19 pandemic is the most devastating global health crisis in over a century. During the crisis, East Asian countries and the territories have kept the number of COVID-19 deaths per population lower than in other countries. The world has drawn its attention to how East Asia and Southeast Asia, including Malaysia, has managed the risk of COVID-19 and control the potential damage. Today, we are delighted to welcome Dr. Ko Suiken from Malaysia to present his insights on Malaysia's response to COVID-19. Dr. Ko, welcome to IHA's webinar, uh, Our Leaders Shaping the Future of the Indo-Pacific. So Dr. Ko Suiken is a Malaysian physician specializing in health systems and global health. He's CEO of Angsana Health, which is a company building primary healthcare systems in Southeast Asia. He also has concurrent appointments at Chatham House, the National University of Singapore, and the United Nations University, and advises the Malaysian government on health reforms. Previously, he held progressively senior practice roles in clinical medicine, refugee relief, and Fortune 100 pharma. In these roles, he was based in Malaysia, Singapore, Dubai, Shanghai, and Paris, covering Asia, Africa, Europe, and the Middle East. He holds three postgraduate degrees in internal medicine from the Royal College of Physicians, public health from Berkeley, and public policy from Oxford, and has published more than 190 articles in international academic journals think tanks in the media, including the Council on Foreign Relations, Foreign Affairs, The Lancet, and the Project Shinjigate. With that, I would like to welcome Dr. Suiken, Dr. Ko Suiken, SK, to present his analysis on Malaysia's response to COVID-19. Over to you, SK. Arigato Sagara-san, it is a pleasure to be here and thank you very much uh, to everyone for having me. What I would like to do now is to share my screen and uh, then we can get started with the presentation. Great, I'll put this into presentation mode and I hope that you can still see my screen. Sagara-san and uh, my friends in the International House of Japan, um, greetings uh, from uh, Malaysia and Singapore where I am based. I'm very pleased to speak with all of you today about the Malaysian response to COVID in the last two, two and a half years or so. I really only have uh, two slides in my presentation and I will speak uh, for about 15 minutes to talk about the Malaysian response. I'll begin by saying a few words uh, um, about my disclosure and uh, the introduction to myself a little bit. Is to say firstly that uh, I have uh, the opinions uh, in this particular talk are entirely my own, and I declare no conflicts of interest uh, between this talk and my current positions. Uh, Sagara-san has mentioned that uh, I was a medical doctor for six years, and I was in pharma for eight years, covering several countries. And for the last three years, I've been working in health systems and global health, notably in the National University in Singapore, in Chatham House and also the United Nations University. Angsana Health is the name of a company I set up to build primary care services in Malaysia. And uh, I have a training in internal medicine, in public health and in public policy. The opinions here in this particular talk are entirely my own. And again, there are no conflicts of interest. I'm very happy to move on to my next slide. And in this next slide, uh, Sagara-san and my friends, uh, is the only slide that I will use to describe Malaysia's response to COVID-19. We will begin around March 2020, uh, all the way up to November 2022. Uh, March, Malaysia's first case was in January 2020, on the 25th of January, 
but it became much more serious in March of 2020, just like the rest of the world as well. What I will do in this one slide, Sagarasan, is firstly, in blue, to compare Malaysia to other countries, and we'll also compare a little bit with Japan. Then we will look at the political instability in Malaysia during COVID. Uh, and that's in the box in red in the center of the screen. And this political instability obviously affected the healthcare, security, and the social response, which I will discuss finally um, in green in the right-hand side of the screen. Let's begin by comparing Malaysia to other countries. There are many ways to compare Malaysia's performance during COVID to other countries. We can use death rates, case rates, testing rates, uh, vaccination rates, the economic impact, mental health impact, and so on. We can also measure this in absolute terms or in per capita terms. The point being that of the many different metrics to measure the quality of a country's response, perhaps death rates are the best way to measure the quality of a country's response because deaths are, firstly, because deaths are not negotiable. You cannot dispute the statistical meaning of a death. Number two, um, deaths are very final events uh, with a lot of uh, ancillary or rather downstream effects that require, that require us to understand how health systems and social care systems work to prevent death. And thirdly, there is a cultural and philosophical, a deep cultural and deep philosophical meaning to death itself. So for public health reasons and for structural reasons, death rates are probably a good way to measure a country's performance during COVID. And here we see that the United States and the United Kingdom have got about 3,000 deaths per million people from COVID so far. That is a lot of um, um, deaths and they're um, leading uh, in terms of this uh, very um, difficult metric. Then we see Germany at about uh, 2,000, just under 2,000 deaths per million people. Then Canada and here's Malaysia in blue at about 1,080 deaths. Um, per million people. Japan's much lower at about 400 deaths per million people and China's much lower, close to zero deaths um, or something like that uh, per million people. But that's uh, coming at a great cost uh, because our friends in, Japan, uh, in China are going through um, a lot of lockdowns uh, since uh, 2020 itself. So just a quick look at the cumulative deaths indicate that Malaysia's about average and China, Japan and, and China are doing above average and below average would be uh, countries like the United States and the United Kingdom. Let's look at the comparison between Japan and Malaysia on the, the small uh, table at the bottom of your screen. Japan's much bigger than Malaysia, four times the population of Malaysia, 126 million, 33 million. The cases per million uh, in Japan are much higher, not much higher, but uh, higher than Malaysia, about 30% uh, higher than compared to Malaysia. So about 200,000 cases per million cumulative, and Malaysia is about 150,000 cases cumulated. Malaysia's death per million um, is about uh, two and a half times higher than Japan, and Japan and Malaysia has got a roughly equal vaccination rate. This is a good sign because uh, in Japan, there is a little bit more vaccine hesitancy, um, which is a little unusual for a high income country, but that's because of many historical reasons as well. Nonetheless, Japan's vaccination rates for COVID across the population, aged um, 18 to um, say 99, uh, is 83%, which is two percentage points higher than Malaysia. This is a comparison for Malaysia's response to COVID. I would say, um, to, to summarize in one word, uh, average, except for vaccination, which is above average. So Malaysia not, did not do better than other countries in terms of our COVID response, but, uh, oh, sorry, we did better in some ways and we were weaker in some ways. So I think our response overall was pretty average. Uh, if you look at the death rates of COVID per million population, we were around the middle. Let's move on to the section in red. When we talk about Malaysia's response to COVID, we can talk about health, social, and security, which I'll discuss later. A very important point, unfortunately, during COVID was Malaysia's um, political instability. It's actually a very polite way to, to describe what happened in Malaysia. 
in three years, we had four prime ministers and four health ministers. Uh, we had one prime minister in January 2020 in the first, uh, when the first case of COVID was reported. We changed the prime minister in March 2020, changed again in August 2021, and changed again in November 2022. So literally, four prime ministers, one pandemic. Four prime ministers also gave us four health ministers, and all this happened in a very short period of time. Needless to say, it was very unstable. However, the unstable politics led to higher citizen participation in the COVID response. In many countries, the government led the response because the government's big, organized, has a lot of money, has all the resources uh, that is needed to uh, for fight COVID. In Malaysia, the government is big, employs a lot of people, has a lot of money, and has a lot of resources too. But with instability, it led to citizens participating more. So a lot of uh, Malaysia's COVID response was led not only by the government, of course the government was there, but it was led also by citizens, by NGOs and foundations and charities, and also the private sector. I will give two hashtags, uh, and if we Google this hashtag, we will see a lot of what happened in Malaysia. Kita jaga kita, meaning we take care of ourselves, not uh, government takes care of us but we take care of ourselves. And the second hashtag is Rakyat Jaga Rakyat. Jaga, J-A-G-A, -A, in the Malay language means to take care of. Rakyat is citizens or the population of Malaysia or Malaysians. So we take care of ourselves is the first hashtag. And the second hashtag is the people take care of the people or the citizens take care of the citizens. These are not just hashtags on Twitter. These are movements of many, many Malaysians, I don't know how many, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of Malaysians, nobody counts these things, right? Um, but many, many people were in this movement. And this movement is not just a few days, it lasted for months, three, six, nine months or so, especially in the year 2020. These movements were very strong and they were spontaneously organized. The private sector also helped. They mobilized donations, they built new supply chains for personal protective equipment in the beginning where we needed gloves and masks and uh, gowns and aprons. By going to China, for example, or going to Vietnam and going to Indonesia and getting new uh, sources of uh, these PPEs into Malaysia, some of the private factories changed their production lines, retooled their machines to produce PPEs. So previously they produced clothes and textiles, now they produce PPEs. And the private sector also supported local communities, giving food packets, providing donations, and supporting um, people who needed care if their family members go to hospitals. Because um, in Malaysia, for a long period of time, if you have COVID, you're quarantined. And the private sector stepped in to take care of family members who were not quarantined. Overall, the response in Malaysia was resilient. It showed that COVID is an all-of-society problem meaning government alone was not enough. We needed all of society to come in, similar to a cohesive society like Japan or South Korea. These are all very important responses because government alone cannot solve a problem like COVID. The lesson here for from Malaysia, for Malaysia, for Japan and for other countries is that governments should enable and help organize the crisis response of society what I mean is, and by enabling is, here's a, uh, the legal infrastructure, the regulatory framework, the guidelines for an NGO to operate. And governments should help organize a society's crisis response. For example, providing a coordination function for a government ministry, a dashboard, for example, a database where who needs what can be matched to who can give what. All that um, should be the role of government. The role of government is not to monopolize the crisis response, that they are the only entity providing crisis response. No government in the world is ever able to be the only responder to a crisis. We need multiple responders. So the role of government is not to monopolize the response, but to enable and also organize the response from society. This is the, the impact from a political analysis about Malaysia's political instability and how it led to a resilient response from the community.
Sagarasan, I will move on to the last portion over here, which is about the healthcare, security, as well as the, um, the social response. But over here, this is, these are things that you can find on the internet. We can read a lot more about uh, all these details on the internet. So therefore, I will not uh, go into too much detail. Instead, I'll give some high-level strategic um, say, views about Malaysia's response in healthcare, firstly. So healthcare, the Ministry of Health in Malaysia, so in Malaysia it's called MOH, in Japan it's called MO, Ministry of Health, Labour and Welfare, in Malaysia it's just the Ministry of Health. They're in charge of healthcare. They created search capacity, for example, using private hospitals. So Malaysia has got 40,000 hospital beds and two-thirds or 60% is in the public sector or government sector and 20,000 beds or one-third is in the uh, uh, private sector. So two-thirds government bids and one-third private sector bids. That's a lot of bids in the private sector. So the Ministry of Health um, worked with the private hospitals to improve search capacity. And this is in terms of using healthcare bids and also the doctors and the nurses and the ventilators and the intensive care units as well, not just the hospital bids. Secondly, there was a rapid vaccination program started around March 2021 and Malaysia is one of the earliest uh, countries in Southeast Asia to start and also one of the fastest vaccinating countries in Southeast Asia. At one point, we were vaccinating maximum speed, 500,000 people a day. That's half a million people a day. Uh, and that is a very fast rate. It's as though we are vaccinating Japan uh, in, in about uh, 60 days or so just to vaccinate, sorry, I apologize, uh, to vaccinate Japan in about uh, six months all of Japan, to vaccinate all of Japan in six months. And that is a very fast rate. Uh, um, and Malaysia's, uh, I'm, I'm very proud of Malaysia's uh, very fast uh, vaccination program. Thanks to the minister in charge of, partially thanks to the minister in charge um, of vaccinations, but obviously partially thanks to him and partially thanks to everyone else in the system who vaccinated, who built the databases, who procured the vaccines, transported the vaccines and so on. Thirdly, Malaysia had mandatory contact tracing but this is similar to other countries as well. In security terms, Malaysia had movement control orders. Uh, it's what we call uh, lockdowns. It, it's a pleasant term to describe a lockdown. We call it movement control orders. The movement control orders were from March 2020 to November 2021, so essentially one and a half years. It wasn't always this strict. It gradually reduced in strictness uh, over a period of time. It was officially ended in November of 2021. The levels of strictness reduced over time. However, certain districts and states um, may have a targeted MCO for a short period of time, and then it was lifted as well. So it wasn't always district all the time throughout the country for one and a half years. It gradually reduced with some small areas in which uh, they had some uh, stricter MCOs or movement control orders for a short period of time. Malaysia also closed our borders, um, perhaps as tightly as Japan's. Um, from March 2020 to April 2022, um, no foreigner could come into Malaysia unless they had some special permissions and um, with a lot of, uh, um, say, ap application processes, only then could they come in. Malaysians obviously can come in and out. There was a quarantine or a home isolation period for a, a <clears throat> sorry, for a period of time uh, during the border closures. All borders were open in April of 2022, so anybody can come into Malaysia right now uh, with a COVID test, uh, but without a, a, a need for a home isolation or hotel isolation. Let me move on to the social response. I'll begin by saying that it is not easy to quantify the impact on education, to quantify the impact on nutrition and food security, to quantify the impact on job and income losses, and to quantify the impact on mental health. It, um, some studies have shown um, that X number of jobs were lost, Y percent of economic growth was lost, and Z amount of people uh, has got mental health conditions. And all those are good estimates. But frankly, in Malaysia and also other countries, it is simply impossible to say with absolute certainty what the impact on education was, because um, maybe about um, Malaysia is quite a young country, so we have about 9 million people who are below the age of 18. 
9 million people below the age of 18 who did not go to school. How do you quantify the impact on their education? And that the point I'm making is that we, we will never, we will not be able to quantify the impact on education, nutrition, job, economy, income, mental health, perhaps five or 10 years into the future. It, take, it will probably take that long from a social science perspective. What did the government do? The government provided eight relief measures in 15 months. So between March 2020, all the way to around July of 2021, the Malaysian government provided about 188 billion US dollars worth of relief measures. These relief measures is a combination of direct government money or government allowing um, withdrawals from the pension funds or the provident funds of Malaysians or direct uh, subsidies to the, to the um, companies of Malaysia as well. So overall, uh, we can say that uh, um, these relief measures were helpful um, but I'm not in a position to say that are they enough? Because uh, if you say, uh, if you ask the question, is it enough? The answer will always be yes and no, mostly towards no, because every citizen in the world always wants their governments to give them unlimited money. This is a standard fact of life. Everybody wants their government to give not 188 billion US dollars, not enough. We should give 1.8 trillion US dollars. And yet there'll still be people who say that there is not enough. So it's difficult to say whether or not these um, relief measures have been adequate or enough, but we can definitely say that these relief measures have been very needed and helpful to the population. I think that if we had less political instability in Malaysia, we could have mounted a, a better response. And uh, if um, Malaysia um, manage our finances uh, uh, better, we will also be able to provide a little bit more, um, say, uh, social response and a subsidy response as well. So in summary, for Malaysia's response uh, to COVID-19, I will end by saying that Malaysia followed most countries in combining the health and the security and the social responses without really significant uh, policy variations uh, between countries. So overall, I think Malaysia um, did well during COVID, but we did well on average. I don't think that we were spectacularly managing COVID, but neither did we manage COVID uh, so poorly um, that, we're, that we are suffering from its consequences uh, um, till today. So overall, I will give Malaysia uh, um, an, uh, an overall score of perhaps uh, an average response to COVID um, with a partial defense of the Malaysian government uh, is to say that um, COVID is not something that we're prepared for. No government was prepared for COVID. So we had to do a lot of new policies and new procedures um, in response to something that we've never planned for or never prepared for. So we must excuse the Malaysian government slightly. Uh, we cannot excuse the political instability though. Finally, is to say that uh, um, the Mal what was most impressive about Malaysia's response to COVID was the people of Malaysia who took care of each other and the citizens of Malaysia who also took care of each other. And I'd like to end on that note, that pandemics and COVID was a situation where the individual citizens of a country took care of each other in Malaysia, as opposed to um, a strong role for the government. Sagarasan, thank you so much again. I pass the floor back to you. Thank you, SK, for presenting your insights to us. So <clears throat> I was quite impressed that difficult, uh, the, um, the, despite the difficult political instability, many citizens and NGOs participated in the COVID response. So I think uh, we, we saw that uh, civil society in Malaysia uh, showed its resilience. Um, it's quite impressive. <clears throat> so, and I'd like to ask you some questions about Malaysia's response to COVID-19. So <clears throat> you have already touched upon some good practices in Malaysia. So, could you talk a little bit more about what measures went well and at, and at which stages? Sure. The first measure that went well was the vaccination program. To, um, so Malaysia is a middle income country. We have to begin uh, with the fact that we're not rich. And yet we managed to get a good um, supply of vaccines, including booster doses early on. And, then, and I think this is testament to negotiating skills by the Malaysian government uh, and, and 
well, specifically, perhaps uh, the, the vaccination team uh, led by the minister in charge uh, and the Ministry of Science, Technology and Innovation. So what went well was the vaccination program starting with the fact that we could procure, we could buy the vaccines in the open market um, despite being a middle-income country and we're not uh, the high-income country like the Japan or South Korea or Singapore or Hong Kong which could pay high prices for the vaccines. So I think this is one big win. Secondly, in the vaccination program was the fact that we could deliver and organize the vaccines. So yeah, we bought the vaccines. Great, we have a lot of vaccines now. What do we do with the vaccines, right? Then you have to send the vaccines to all over Malaysia. And Malaysia has a lot of rural parts. Secondly, you have to get the doctors and nurses to train to deliver those vaccines. Thirdly, you have to organize the databases for the vaccines. Fourthly, you have to organize the cold chain and logistics because those vaccines are stored in temperatures of sometimes uh, 4 Celsius or below 4 Celsius as well. So all that needed to be organized. And that was really good and went well. And thirdly, in a vaccination program, is vaccine confidence. It was a, a massive exercise to vaccinate the entire adult population in a short period of time with anti-vaxxers and people who believe in ivermectin and people who did not believe in the science and, and or attacked the government. And vaccine confidence um, efforts, public communications, public advocacy, all that became important uh, in uh, supporting the vaccination program. So you ask me what went well, I'll say vaccinations. But starting with procurement, and then the delivery and organization, and then thirdly, the vaccine confidence elements. There's a second thing that went well, uh, all things being equal, um, is that th there is a reasonable government response in terms of social welfare protection. Most of the time, when we're thinking about pandemics and health security, we don't think about the softer aspects of health security. We only think about the hard aspects of health security, like lockdowns, border closures, mandatory contact tracing, quarantines and isolation. These are all very hard measures to fight the pandemic. But there are soft measures which are very important. Nutrition, mental health, access to primary care, access to universal health coverage and insurance, um, labor rights, like if you have COVID, you should be able to stay at home instead of going to work. All that requires the social determinants of health. And the government did realize uh, that there was an important need to focus on the social response. Subsidies uh, for electricity uh, so that people can stay at home, more labor rights, uh, more rights uh, for people to migrant workers, for example, to stay in better living conditions. Because we pack migrant workers uh, um, a lot of migrant workers in a small space. But COVID has shown that we need to uh, distribute migrant workers uh, to larger spaces so they don't infect each other with COVID. All that are social determinants of health. And the Malaysian government realized this and did reasonably well here too. These are the two things that went well, or the two policies that went well, the vaccination program and the social determinants of health. Thank you, Sagarasan. Over to you. Yeah, and also I've heard that financial support in Malaysia is quite generous and inclusive, not just generous, and as you mentioned in the last part of your presentation. And it's, I think the, the key word is, um, uh, I think the general and inclusive. And I think um, government officials or vulnerable groups in informal sectors can receive some assistance from the Malaysian government. So what are social protection policies or measures implemented in Malaysia? Um, could you talk a bit about uh, protection for, especially for vulnerable groups? Mm. Thank you. Firstly, we have to begin by defining uh, what is a vulnerable group. Um, and there are many different ways to describe uh, or define a vulnerable group. And each of those ways have got pros and cons. Um, and um, if we draw the definition very broad, then maybe 99% of the population can be considered vulnerable because even the, the, the top, uh, say, 98th percentile might, might not be as rich as the 99th percentile. Anyway, we're getting quite philosophical. I'll return to your question. Your question is, what did Malaysia do for the vulnerable groups? I'll say, firstly, we define what's vulnerable. Malaysia defined vulnerable in maybe two broad categories. The first category is poor. The second category is rural. So poor people... Um, that we uh, in Malaysia, we call the B40. B40, the B stands for, the, the letter B stands for bottom. Then there is M40 for middle and T20 for the top 20%. 
these are arbitrary distinctions, really, um, because the government subsidies need to help the bottom 40% of the population more than it helps the T20 or the top 20% of the population. So the first, uh, the first thing we understand is that the definition of what is vulnerable is poor and rural. Rural because they may be further away from medical care, hospitals and doctors, but also because people in the rural parts of Malaysia um, are more likely to be poor than the people in the urban parts of Malaysia. For your information, Malaysia is about 70-71% urban, not rural. So only 30% of the population are in rural. We can define these two broad categories, but obviously there'll be others. Women can be considered a vulnerable population. Children below 18 and especially below 12, vulnerable. Migrant workers and non-citizens can also be considered vulnerable. To an extent, Malaysia's uh, social welfare protection policies cover all vulnerable groups to an extent. However, the focus is really more on the poor and the rural and less, uh, and then to women and then to children and then to the migrant workers. I offer no judgment about um, um, whether or not that rank order or the sequence is correct or not correct. Because um, it's difficult to say that, uh, for example, poor is more important than women or children are more important than migrants or migrants are more important than poor. It's very difficult to make the moral judgment of which is more important. I just reflect this fact neutrally to you. Um, if we go to the internet, it will give us a full list of all the details of how much was given to which group, how, when, and why. Um, I do not have all this information uh, off the top of my head. I'm already I'm only able to give you that uh, these are two vulnerable groups, the poor and the rural populations of Malaysia. Broadly speaking, though, the two most important instruments uh, to provide uh, this uh, support is actually through direct subsidies um, to the poor measured in a few hundred ringgit on a monthly basis for the uh, either the individual or the family. The point being that this money was channeled in a direct subsidy format um, after some means testing by a government agency called the uh, um, Social Welfare Department. The Social Welfare Department is under the Ministry of Family, Women and Community Development. So the money was channeled from the Treasury to the Ministry to the Social Welfare Department, which then channeled it to their own database, which they've collected over years and decades of who are the poor people, uh, families are, that are living in Malaysia. And that's broadly speaking, who the vulnerable populations are and the method of uh, financing, which is um, skewing more towards the uh, direct subsidies. Um, thank you again, Sagarasan. over to you. Okay. And you've mentioned some lessons, um, I think, uh, one big lesson was that uh, government should enable or uh, civil organizations uh, for or crisis response and next pandemic. So I'm I'm curious about lessons uh, from this crisis, and also if there's any lesson from past infectious diseases like SARS or MERS. Um, could you talk a little bit more about lessons um, from the pandemic? Uh, thank you. Uh, this is a good question because um, COVID is nearly over. It's not, of course, it's not over yet. We still have a lot of infections, just that people around the world and governments around the world were tired of COVID. And uh, in their minds, uh, COVID is already over. And because we feel or believe that it's already over, we are missing the opportunity to learn the lessons. So here are some lessons from Malaysia. The first one is that the governments of the world, including Malaysia, should enable an organized society's response, not to be jealous or feel threatened if there's an NGO that can do something that you can't. And some governments feel threatened, like, oh, an NGO is um, helping the population and, and then it might make the government look bad. And many governments are insecure, they feel threatened. And uh, without naming any government, uh, I think this is just a fact of life. And then governments try to uh, reduce the space for NGOs to operate by making it difficult for them to register, to raise money, to, to uh, deliver those funds. Um, and this is sad and probably wrong. So therefore, governments should enable a society's response and not to stop a society's response. That is lesson number one. Lesson number two, um, no bad politics. Now, politics can be neutral, you know. Politics is just a way to uh, make decisions and assign resources, allocate resources. So politics can be neutral. 
many politics though can be bad. So a big lesson and a whole speech over here, which I won't give, is we, we don't want bad politicians. And bad politicians should be voted out of power and we should vote in good politicians. Why? Because health is political. And that's the third lesson. The third, so the second lesson, first lesson is governments uh, uh, to enable society's response and not to um, say stop it. Number two, we need good politicians and good politics, not bad politicians. Because thirdly, the third lesson is health is a political choice. And in this lesson, um, we often think that public health, sorry, pandemics, disease X, um, problems of health is all scientific Science will fix it. Technology will fix it. Vaccines will help us. Hospitals, doctors, ventilators. Science will save all of us. It's not true. Science is only 50% of the solution. The other 50% is politics. Because even with the best of science, if you don't deliver the vaccines, you don't find the money to pay doctors so that they stay in your country and they don't go to other countries to work. You don't increase vaccine confidence you don't find a way to ensure everyone in Malaysia or in any country. All these things are political and economic choices. They're not scientific choices. So a lesson over here would be uh, that health is a political choice. It's not only a scientific choice. And if we make good political choices, we will have better health. Let me end with one uh, final lesson. And this lesson is for healthcare professionals, doctors, nurses, dentists, public health, epidemiologists, scientists, um, people who work uh, in, in uh, say, the, the regulatory affairs, uh, like Japan FDA, for example, people like that. All these health professionals, right? We need to mobilize, organize, and politicize. Because if we want better health, all the health professionals in a country want better health for the citizens, we cannot stay inside the hospitals and the laboratories. We have to go out. I'm not saying um, protest in the streets or riot in the streets. No, don't do that. However, be um, appropriately political and get politicians to listen to the scientists. And to get politicians to listen to the scientists, the scientists, the doctors, and the university professors cannot just write papers, stay in hospitals and clinics. We have to go out. And in going out to forming, um, say, appropriate advocacy and policy groups, we can then influence our government policy. And that's a big lesson for the profession as well. Because usually the health professions, the scientists and the, the doctors, we stay in the labs and we stay in the hospital. We don't really go out to talk to governments, generally speaking. And we need to, and when we talk to governments, we need to talk to the government about politics and economics as much as we talk to them about the sciences. Those are my lessons from Malaysia. Sagarasan, over to you. Yeah, great lessons. Um, I think the resilience in Malaysian civil society is quite impressive, as I mentioned. And I think the, the civil-led uh, response to COVID-19 is, uh, is quite important. Um, and I think it should be a challenge for many governments that how governments uh, can get buy-in from their citizens because infectious diseases cannot be controlled by the government. Um, it, it needs cooperation from the population. So I think the lessons from Malaysia is quite important uh, for other countries. And last question. Um, so you have told us some very important lessons, but um, we all need to prepare not only for the next surge of COVID-19, but also for a future pandemic. Um, so we have SARS, MARS, flu, and we may have the next serious um, pandemic. Um, WHO calls it disease X, as you mentioned. It's a, a kind of the word from scientists, but disease X means that a uh, serious infectious disease that could cause outbreaks by a pathogen, currently unknown. So we may face more highly lethal coronavirus. Um, so it was COVID-19. So we may face COVID-25 or even 23. We don't know yet. So you mentioned preparedness is difficult, but I think we learned some lessons. So I'm just curious about the views that how should we prepare for the next pandemic? 
Another excellent question uh, and uh, one to end this off, uh, Sagarasan. thank you. It's not an easy question to answer and uh, because there are a lot of things that we need to do to prepare for the next pandemic. Let me offer two, just two. One at the national level and one at the global level. Otherwise, uh, it will be a list, like a long list of the things that we need to do. And the reason why I focus on the national first and then the global is because of the 195 plus minus countries in the world right now, health happens at that country level. Health doesn't happen in Geneva. For example, the World Health Organization does not operate any hospitals. It doesn't deliver any healthcare service. It doesn't deliver any vaccinations. It doesn't operate any clinics. That's the World Health Organization. But you know who delivers clinics? Oh, sorry, who builds clinics, operates hospitals, delivers vaccines, performs surgeries, delivers universal health coverage? Governments do. 195 governments around the world. Therefore, global health, however you define it, is as important or maybe even less important compared to national health. And national health is where a lot of the action takes place. And at the national health level, here's a list of things to do, right? I'll focus on just one, but a list of them will be things like improve public health, improve laboratory capacity, build your own vaccines, uh, improve your uh, research and development for vaccines, train more doctors, build more clinics, build more hospitals, train more nurses. All that is very true. Uh, and there's a whole list of all the things we can do to prepare for the next pandemic. All that will help prepare for the next pandemic. There's one thing, though, that frequently people don't talk about, which is the social determinants of health. Specifically, what are the conditions in which um, a person would live, work, and also play and grow old and die eventually? Meaning, there is even if you can finance all the healthcare in the world, you have a lot of money and that you can build hospitals and build clinics and train nurses and, and buy vaccines. All that is great. Even if you have all the money in the world, but you're not talking about the social determinants of health, like whether or not if a person has got an infectious disease, can this person uh, stay at home and still get paid? Some of the most difficult challenges in Malaysia in the informal economy, about 40% of Malaysia is informal, is uh, I've got COVID, yes, I should stay at home. I know that so that I don't infect other people. But if I don't go out to work, I don't get money to buy food so I don't die from hunger. So the, my, my options are stay at home and die from hunger or go out to work, don't die from hunger, but I can get enough money to, um, I, I might infect other people with COVID. These are very difficult choices. And this is a, this is a, a not non-healthcare decision. This is a social and political and economic decision. And that's what national governments need to do to prepare for the next pandemic by focusing on the social determinants of health. For example, that one example that I just provided. Healthcare is great. Social determinants of health are equally great and equally important. That's what national governments can do. Number two is to talk about global health. Now, the list of things about global health is very easy to say vaccine equity, it must be fair for everyone to get vaccines, we must distribute resources appropriately, we must help low and middle income countries build their health system, rich countries cannot monopolize um, resources like face masks and ventilators and vaccines, all that is very easy to talk about, including matters of financing, matters of uh, who is going to pay for what in healthcare. Also, we uh, probably need to talk about intellectual property as in can companies like uh, Pfizer or J&J &J or Moderna continue holding the patent to their vaccines for X number of years? What is X uh, number of years? And how do we agree to World Trade Organization rules? All these things are the standard things that we have to do. Here's one more though, um, which is not really discussed yet. And it's an issue of enforcement. We can talk a lot about uh, so the legitimacy of the United Nations, the effectiveness of the United Nations, and whether or not the United Nations is a post-World War II, uh, say, infrastructure. The P5, or the veto powers by the five permanent members of the Security Council, reflects World War II, uh, winners of World War II. It doesn't reflect the world today. Yeah, we can talk endlessly about, is it democratic? Is it effective? Is it uh, legitimate? Is it well-funded of the United Nations and World Health Organization, World Trade Organization, the World Bank, and all that? All, all that is a beautiful conversation. 
The point I'm making is about enforcement. We already have existing laws in the world today, right now, that has got pretty strong, um, say, standards for how a country needs to prepare. But those standards are not matched by enforcement. What I mean to say is, the World Health Organization has an international health regulations. Inside the international health regulations, there's something called a joint external evaluation that sends uh, the country, uh, sorry, for example, like Malaysia, we had our JEE or joint external evaluation in 2019 and everything we did quite well. Now, um, WHO would send people to come to Malaysia, spend three to six months and assess the country's uh, readiness for a pandemic. All that infrastructure is already there. We might not need to create a new pandemic treaty, global health threats council, uh, WHO number two. We don't need to create all that. All we need, because if you create all that, you will still have the same problem of enforcement. What we need to do is probably give more enforcement powers to the current um, structure and framework. And I end with four uh, ways for us to enforce. The first one is self-review. You look at yourself and joint external evaluation from WHO including the antimicrobial uh, self-assessment are two examples of self-review. Secondly, you can also look at peer review. Example, South Korea reviews Japan and Japan reviews South Korea. Malaysia reviews Singapore. Singapore reviews Malaysia, if you consider a peer. Not neighboring countries, just a peer. And in doing a peer review, we have uh, some um, mechanisms as well. For example, the um, Human Rights Council has got a peer review process. The Financial Action Task Force has a peer review process as well. Thirdly, we can do external reviews. And in external reviews is when uh, a, a group of auditors or independent people come in to review a country. Example would be International Labour Organization and the Paris Agreement for Climate Change for Nationally Determined Contributions. That has got an external review. So you have self-review, then you have peer review, then you have external review, and then finally, at the very top, you can have something called uh, an external inspection and unconsented review or anything that, uh, uh, anything that one prefers. The Organization for the Prohibition of Chemical Weapons, OPCW, the Subcommittee on the Prevention of Torture, and the International Atomic Energy Agency has got the ability to go in and inspect the country to make sure there's no chemical weapons, there's no torture, and there's no nuclear weapons as well. Now, of course, it's open to uh, problems, open to abuse. We don't want a situation when um, the United States invades Iraq, for example, uh, just on the, on the suspicion of the weapons of mass destruction. The point being that there are already existing mechanisms in the world where the international community, after a certain due diligence process, can inspect another country's another country um, for chemical weapons, for torture, and also for um, nuclear weapons. Now, I'm not saying that we need to forcibly go into a country to inspect their health readiness. That's not what I'm saying. What I'm saying is have a combination of self-review, peer review, external review, and unconsented reviews so that we can have proper enforcement. We know what to do, and we want countries to do it. Let's just go on and enforce it. So these are the two big ways that we can uh, prepare for pandemic X. As a whole list, I've only concentrated on two. At the national level, focus on social determinants. At the global level, focus on enforcement. Sagara-san, thank you. Over to you. Thank you. I totally agree with you on the importance of reviews. So we, API, has conducted policy reviews on Japan's response to COVID-19 in the first wave of the COVID. So it was the, the first half of 2020. And also we are now conducting uh, reviews on East to Asian response to COVID-19. And I think we have found was that resilience is the keyword. And I think also the trust is the second keyword in this region. But I think, um, as you mentioned, um, I think we need to learn more each other. And the peer review is, is really important. So we had we had great lessons uh, for national governments uh, and also national health and also global health. Uh, we learned a lot from SK. So Dr. Ko Suikem, uh, thank you very much for joining us today. Thank you. Arigato Sagara-san, it's a pleasure to, to be here and I look forward to continuing engagements at the International House of Japan. Thank you again. Thank you so much.